lot of times God does things that we don't understand. That doesn't make sense to us. Now, I, I like chess. I like to watch chess games. Um, how many people in here play chess, know how to, how to play chess? Okay. Okay. Um, what is the second most valuable piece of, of your chess set? Queen. Absolutely. What's the most valuable? King. king. King is the most valuable because without the king you lose the game. But the queen is the second most valuable because she can move any direction that she wants as far as she wants. She's a valuable asset. Now, um, for those of you that follow anything with chess, uh, one of the greatest chess masters was Bobby Fischer. And I was watching one of the games with Bobby Fischer, and your, your game takes place in three phases. You have the opening phase, you have the, the beginning of the game where you set everything up, how you're going to play. Then you have the mid-game, and that's where you're playing for position and pieces, and then you have the end game where you're hopefully putting them into checkmate. Okay. Well, in this game, Bobby Fischer, um, right at the start of the mid-game, they just basically put their pieces where they wanted to start. Bobby Fischer sacrificed his queen. And at, looking at the board, it was an absolutely idiotic thing to do because it did not improve his situation at all. It actually hurt his situation. But see, Bobby Fischer had an incredible mind for the game, and he saw the game played out over the long haul. He didn't just see, like most of us when we play chess, we see one move at a time. Some people that play chess well are able to look two or three moves down the road. Okay? And people that play chess really well we're talking grandmasters, they see the entire game at the outset, okay? Um, Benjamin has, has studied quite a bit. Uh, Josh has studied quite a bit at, about the game, and um, I, I'm, not that, I'm not that devoted to it, okay? But they, they can tell you after just like two pieces being moved, what opening you're making. I'm just like, I don't know, I just moved the piece because I thought it looked cool, <laughs> okay? And, uh, but, Bobby Fisher sacrificed his queen. Now this, this is the second most valuable piece on the board because it can get into and out of just about anywhere. Well, what the opposite player didn't see and what I didn't see when he first sacrificed his queen was that between his knight and his uh, rook, Bobby Fisher had set up a gamut whereby the king on the opposing table was stuck and he could only advance laterally across the board until he ended up in the corner square where he would end up in checkmate. And it took about seven more moves until that happened. Now, when I'm looking at the game, I'm going, oh my gosh, you just sacrificed your queen for nothing. You didn't even get a pawn out of it. You just, you just threw her away. Well, by sacrificing his queen, he opened up his opponent's lines so that he could attack the king, which is the most valuable piece on the, the board, okay? See, we're looking at what God's doing with our limited insight because we can only see one move at a time. We can only see what's happening to us right now, and we don't even see that very well, okay? Because we, we tend to operate in this, this veil of stupidity and ignorance. Now, ignorance is not stupidity. Okay, you have to understand ignorance means you just don't know, <coughs> right? Okay, ignorance can be remedied, okay? You uh, grab hold of a line, you're not sure if it's a shock line or not, you're operating in ignorance. So you touch the line and guess what happens? You find out whether it's a shock line or not, okay? That can be remedied because when you find out it is, your ignorance is, has become wisdom and experience, and you know not to grab that line again, okay? Even after your sister told you several times not to touch the line, <laughs> right, Thaddeus? Okay? Um, stupidity is continuing to touch the line. Well, I'm not sure. Well, maybe that first one was a fluke. Maybe the 26th one was a fluke. Maybe, you know, eventually they're going to run out of power, you know? That's stupidity. And we tend to operate in these two extremes where either because of our ignorance we don't know or because we refuse to accept what, what our experience and wisdom has taught us, we, we operate in this limited scope. 
So I, I guess the whole point of what I want to say to start is that God knows what's going on. Okay? God's not taken by surprise. God's not up in heaven going, oh my gosh, I am totally unprepared for this. Okay, team huddle, Holy Spirit, son, what do we do now? Okay, what, you see, all of that was taken care of before he created anything. Okay, so rest in the fact that as surprised and as shocked as you can be at things, God is not. He knows what's going on. He's still in control. When he puts forth his word, it does not return to him void. Okay, so we're going to look at some of these ask the pastor questions. I don't even know how many I've got today. Uh, I know I have two that I'm going to save for next week because they're going to require that we get a little bit more involved in what's going on. Okay, so the first question, we actually have a couple of series of questions that are similar. So I'm going to try and group them together and, and do the similar questions together. So the first one is, is there recycled truth from ancient religions that Jesus preached? Okay, so in essence, the question is, did Jesus just regurgitate something from other faiths that were older than, than Christianity? Okay, and, and my question in return would be, well, which came first, the truth or the lie? Because, see, it was all truth was God's to begin with. Okay, and when we stumble on the truth and we make this discovery, um, you know, it's, the lights go on and the angels sing and we're like, oh. And God's up there going, wow, it only took you. <laughs> you know, I knocked and I knocked and I knocked and I pointed it out. And I had people come to you and tell you. I showed you in my word. I even gave you a song with all the words in it. And now you got it. All right, good job. Whew. Okay. So to answer this question, we have to understand first that all truth comes from God. And even when somebody that does not know God discovers the truth. It's a truth that God already has given. Okay? So when Jesus was ministering on the earth, um, if he regurgitated something from another religion, it's not something that he borrowed. It's something that he's taking back. <clears throat> okay? One of the things that, that really gets me Sometimes is, is, you know, we, we do really weird things in, in church. We do really weird things as Christians. Um, you know, we, there are people that uh, don't celebrate Halloween. And if you don't celebrate Halloween, I'm not standing in judgment of you at all. Okay? Um, if you do celebrate Halloween, I'm, I'm going to stand a little bit in judgment of you. Because it's not whether you do or whether you don't. It's, whether, it's how you do. Okay, what are you celebrating? Okay, if you're celebrating demons and witches and witchcraft and murderer and all of those other things, then, then you're celebrating the wrong thing, okay? And, well, you know, oh, that's the, that's the devil's day. The devil doesn't have authority to take any of God's days. Okay, Monday through Sunday, Sunday through Saturday, they're all his. Okay. from January 1st to December 31st, and then that one day that just kind of shows up every four years, they're all his. Okay, So when Jesus was preaching on earth, and you look at something and you go, hey, that, that's kind of like what Buddha said or, or, or whoever. That was God's first. Okay, And when Jesus is reaffirming that truth, He's doing it from the standpoint of God who knew it to begin with. So, really the question is moot because it doesn't really matter if he repeated that something that some other religious leader or Zoroastrianarianism priest or whatever, it doesn't matter because it was God's first. Okay. So, in this question, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know. I don't study ancient religions. I, I have no idea... Uh, I know that Paul uh, made mention several times of philosophy, uh, of ideas that were common in his day and age. He used those to make a point because he was speaking to people with whom that phrase would be familiar. Jesus did the same thing. 
Do you notice when Jesus was ministering, pay attention to where he was ministering, and all of a sudden the parables that he tells will make a lot more sense. Because when he's up in the area of Galilee, up in Capernaum, and, and uh, the area up there, actually coming down either side, a lot of his parables had to do with fishermen. Okay? And then as he came down, and he came down into Judea, and, and through Samaria, a lot of his parables had to do with farming. And then when he came into Jerusalem, a lot of what he taught had to do with the teachers and the religion and, and the things that were going on. Okay, so pay attention to what's going on because Jesus is making use of what he can to get truth across to people in a way that they'll be able to understand. Okay? Um, so, um, to answer this question, I don't know if he did or not, but even if he did, it was his first. Okay? So there's that. Um, next question. If there are older religions than Christianity, which there are, how do we know our God is the only God? Because he said so. That was easy. <laughs> First, to answer this question in full, we have to look at the source of our information, the Bible. Is the Bible a trustworthy document? Okay. Here at Jesus Community Church, in our statement of faith, our articles of biblical faith, we say that we believe that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant word of God as given in the original language. And we have to add that little clause at the end because there are Bibles that are out there today that have corrupted what was originally given and the meaning whereby it was given. And no, I'm, I'm, you know, you guys can get all excited about, oh, see, I told you, King James only. Only King James, you, you know. Uh, that question will address at another day, King James only. I'm not a King James only guy, okay? Um, but there are translations like the New World Translation. Uh, and I'm probably going to step on some toes here. Um, darn, I forgot the, the translation. It's a, what's it called? The... So the one that we had, David, was like the message or something like that? No. Okay. Contemporary English is okay, but there's one, it's, if people read it all the time, uh, I, would, I would really encourage you uh, with the message, read it with a reputable translation. New American Standard, um, the English Standard Version, New King James, one of the versions that has a reputation because the, the message is not a translation. Okay. It's like the old Living Bible. It was not a translation. It was a paraphrase. They took a translation and tried to make it easier for us to understand. The problem with that is when you're taking something that's already been translated two or three times and, and trying to make it easier to understand, sometimes you miss the original intent. Uh, that's why it's so important for us to go back into the Hebrew Bible into the Old Testament and understand what's going on there because when they bring it up in the New Testament and then we take it across 2,000 years and we stick it into the modern American culture, all of a sudden we're coming up with meanings that were never intended. Okay, so um, as the inherent, authentic word of God, uh, how can we be sure? Uh, there's a, a number of reasons. We've talked before about um, the different manuscripts that we have. Um, we've talked about archaeology supporting uh, the things that Scripture says. More and more we're finding that as they dig deeper, they're, they're going, oh my gosh, here are things that, that Scripture says were there. They're really there. And uh, I told you about William Ramsey, who uh, was a, a, an English archaeologist who set out to disprove the Bible by studying and proving, hey, you know, they said that Jericho was here and it's not here, and they said that this was over here, and they said Solomon had, had stables at Megiddo, and, and, and the, the deeper he dug, the wronger he was. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he came to faith because he realized that what the Bible said happened actually happened, okay? So we looked at the archaeology, we looked at prophecy, uh, some 200 prophecies were fulfilled from anywhere from 400 to 1200 years before the birth of Christ. They were fulfilled in his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Okay? More than 200. Okay? And, and we've looked at other things in prophecy that came to pass exactly as God said they would. So we, we've got 
We've got manuscripts. We've got, uh, actually, you know, it, it's funny because we have so many more manuscripts uh, for this historic document. The, uh, we have, counting fragments, we have some 52,000 manuscripts. Okay. The next closest document that we have, uh, I believe it's Aristotle or maybe Socrates, um, we have about 600. Okay. Nobody questions the authenticity of Aristotle or Socrates or Plato or Homer, um, but everybody questions the authenticity of the Bible. And yet, if we take them with the objective standard that we apply to these others and we apply it to Scripture, Scripture not only shines brighter, but it's better. Okay? Well, then, uh, you know, there's a lot of cults that go through and they say, well, you know, in the Dark Ages, the word got totally messed up, so we need a new word. And that's where the New World Translation came from and the Pearl of Great Price and Doctrines and Covenants and all of these other manuscripts come from because it got messed up. Well, unfortunately for them, in the 1940s, there was a shepherd boy looking for sheep and he chunked a rock into a cave and he hears a plink and he goes up and he looks and he finds these, these canoptic jars and inside these jars are manuscripts. Well, this kid thinking, you know, hey, this would make good leather for my sandals, he takes them to a leather worker, and, and the leather worker is going to make sandals out of them. He opens up and he realizes there's writings. He takes them to a friend of his who's a scholar, and the scholar realizes that he has found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which that name was then applied to him. And these Dead Sea Scrolls contain portions or entire books of every book in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, And when they held them up to light with the modern translations, um, they're exactly the same. There's, there's about a 2% difference that is accounted for either by misspellings of names or by punctuation, okay? So, uh, you know, all of these people that say, well, it got corrupt, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls prove you wrong. It was never corrupted. So, can we trust the Bible? I think we can. Um, <clears throat> so, having said that, we go to the Bible to see what God has to say about all of this. And... Um, there's just a couple of passages I'll give you. There's dozens more. Uh, Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. Um, God says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 45. A couple chapters later, it says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. Psalm 86.10. This is David writing. He says, For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. And then Psalm 18.31. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? See, God's word tells us very plainly, very clearly, there are no other gods. As a matter of fact, um, in several places throughout the Hebrew writings, these other gods, uh, it's made very plain to us that they're not gods at all. They're demonic entities. Okay? When you read about Molech and you read about Asherah and, and you read about Baal and you read about all these other gods, those are demonic entities that the people are bowing down and worshiping. That's exactly what the devil wanted. Remember, he wanted to ascend to the heights that he would exceed God and that he might receive praise and, and adulation unto himself. It was his pride. That's what all these false idols are. Okay? And, and we have idols in America, too. Uh, probably the biggest idol in America right at this, this point is money. Everybody bows to the almighty dollar. Okay? That's why I think Jesus was very clear when he said, you know, you, you can't serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other, or you'll love the one and despise the other. And, and you cannot serve both God and man. And Paul writes that uh, um, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Okay, so that we have idols and we, we have things that we bow ourselves down to. So don't look at the, the Hebrews in the Old Testament and the New Testament and go, wow, how did those people ever fall for something like that? We do the same thing. All right, so um, how, how do we know that our God is the only God? Because he said so. What is Christian mysticism? Now, this is, this is a, actually a very broad question. <clears throat> I'm going to narrow it down. Um, as I understand it, Christian mysticism is seeking a personal experiential knowledge of God. OK? 
okay? Such that that experience becomes sovereign. Meaning that uh, you are seeking to know more about God and instead of looking here, you're looking through experiences. Now, absolutely as a Christian, you will have experiences. You're, you're in a relationship with the Almighty God. You, you should have experiences. Okay, but anytime your experience takes you away from this, deviate, deviates from this, or supersedes this, you're off. You're not following God. You're following something else. Okay, whether it be your own foolishness or some false teaching or whatever. Uh, so Christian mysticism is the, the experience becomes the all. It, it, it's more important than anything. There go my questions. Um, so, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Um, for those of you that remember back in the 80s and 90s, it's, it's still out there today, but it's not as big today. Uh, we had the faith movement, which cracks me up, because the faith movement is Christianity. Okay, that's, that's what the faith movement is. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. You cannot be saved without faith. Okay, so that's the faith movement in, in, in truth. But the faith movement came to the point where... Um, your experiences and, and the understanding of the teaching that they were giving um, were more important than the word, okay? Um, I grew up in the faith movement. I grew up in the charismatic movement. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. <gasps> okay. Don't panic, don't run. Um, I absolutely believe that the gifts are for today. I think the Spirit was given to us, the gifts were given to us for a very specific reason, for the edification of the body, okay? The problem that I have with the faith movement in that time was that a lot of these people that were, were, were in the faith movement, they were not trying to edify the body, they were trying to float their own boat and get your money, okay? One of the things I could never understand, I don't understand to this day, is if all these preachers that are saying, if you invest $100 with us, God will return it tenfold to you. If they really believe that, why weren't they sending me their money? Okay. Uh, honestly, if this is really what you believe, then man, you would be given every dime you had away so that you could receive more. Okay. Um, I absolutely believe that God will reward us, but it says in this life and the next, okay, because we're going to see a lot of people in heaven that didn't have a dime to their name. I think of the widow when she came up and she put her two mites in, her, her two pennies in, and, and Jesus told his disciples that widow has given more than all of these others because they're giving out of their prosperity. She's giving out of her need. She, that's all she had to give. Okay? So, Christian mysticism. Um, anytime the experience supersedes the word, you're in hot water, okay? And any time that you have to backpedal and start making excuses for the word or start um, dismissing the word, you're in it deep, okay? That's part of why God, I, I absolutely believe that God orchestrated the church as his body so that we should be accountable one to another. So when I stumble, it, you know, um, drugs do really weird things to me. They don't usually act like they're supposed to act. Um, but I, I can't even remember what I had. I had some procedure done. And the drugs that I had, I couldn't tell if I was standing upright. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm falling. And I, whoa, what happened? Because I, my, my pendulum was off. I couldn't figure out, and you know, it's really weird when you're standing there talking to someone and they go, Weak. and you're, you know, is, okay, is that them or is that me, okay? Uh, 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 you know, when you uh, test to be a pilot, there are two tests that you, you have to take. One, which is to get your license. One is to, to actually get your instrumentation where you can fly uh, different types of planes in different weather, and Gordy can go into this much better than I could because he's a pilot. 
But um, one of the things that they have you do is they put a, a blinder in the windshield and make you fly by your instruments because you have to trust your instruments, okay? Because your sense of balance could be completely thrown off when something bad happens <clears throat> up in the air. And you can think, oh no, absolutely. Uh, there's actually stories of guys that were absolutely convinced that they were doing it right and they're flying upside down, okay? So you trust your instruments. You have to trust your instruments. This is our instruments, okay? This is what we have to trust. When, when those drugs were making me do loopy things, I had to trust Christy was not the one that was tipping over, it was me. <laughs> and when she would caution me, I'd have to take her seriously. I got this! <laughs> Sweetie, help. Okay. okay. So, so this is our guide. This is the foundation on which we stand. If it takes you apart from this, if it deviates from this, be careful. Okay. The body of Christ was put into place such that we could help one another to avoid those things by, by being invested in this. So what is Christian mysticism? Uh, in my understanding of it, anything that experientially exceeds or deviates from the word of God. Okay? Um, passage of scripture that I wanted to read in relation to this. Um, Paul is writing, my, my glass is broke so I don't have my nearsighted and I don't have my midsighted. <clears throat> And so when I put these on, I can't see any of this. When I take them off, I can't see any of you. <laughs> so um, the passage is um, 1 Corinthians 14.1. Um, Paul writes, he says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Okay. Now, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14. All is one piece. Okay, we like to break them apart because chapter 12 talks about the body and it talks about the gifts. Okay, and then 13, there's this parenthetical insert where he talks about love. And then in chapter 14, he goes back to talking about the gifts and talking about the body. Well, they're all one thought. Okay, because he wraps up chapter 12 by saying, now I will show you the better way. Okay, now when... when uh, a lot of the charismatic circles, and I'm, I'm not even going to say charismatic, I'm going to say charismaniac, because there's a difference between charismaniac and charismatic. Charismatic is a believer in the gifts. I believe in the gifts. I believe that the gifts are to be used in accordance with the word as given in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Okay? So he's gone through this list of gifts, he's gone through the body, and he says, I'm going to show you the better way, and then he gives us the chapter of love. Okay? And then he starts off uh, chapter 14. And he says, pursue love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. We, a lot of times uh, in the charismatic circles, we pursue the gifts and kind of desire love. Okay? But you've got to remember that as much as the gifts are of the Spirit, so is the fruit. Okay? And, and Paul lifts off in uh, chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, he lifts, lifts off all of those gifts and he says, you know, hey man, if I have all of these gifts and I can do miraculous things, but I have not love, it's worth nothing. Okay? So, Christian mysticism. <clears throat> it's really not Christian at all. Okay, next question. Is it okay to be a medicine man for God? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm going to take it <clears throat> to me um, you see, here, here's the concern that I have. When I think of a medicine man, I don't think of a doctor. I think of a shaman. Okay. And um, I believe absolutely. Where's Joe? Oh, gosh. She's, she's, she's going to hear this. Okay. Um, just don't, just don't. I absolutely believe that there are some snake oils that do good. Okay. Um, Pat. I was talking with Pat, she and I both have, have issues with headaches. She gets them a lot more often than I do. Uh, I get migraines periodically, and, and when I do, um, you know, when I was a kid, I got them a lot, and then, you know, up until about four years ago, I, I didn't have them. And then four years ago, I was doing something, and all of a sudden, the vision in the middle of my eye just went just blurry, and I could see above, I could see below, I couldn't see anything in the middle. I thought, well, this is really weird. I went and I checked my sugar, because a lot of times, sugar messing up can do that. And, 
no, my sugar's okay, and what's going on? And, and uh, then after about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, it cleared up. Wow, that was really weird. I need to make a note and talk to the doctor about that. Oh my gosh! Oh! And I had a migraine, first one I'd had in, in probably decades. Okay, well, Pat found out that I was having headaches again, and she said, she uses peppermint oil. And, you know, you put a little on where it hurts. I said, well, that's not going to help me because it's the back of my eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sure how to get it there. <laughs> and and so, so she and, and Joe conspired, and they got me some peppermint oil, and it sat on my windowsill for months, months and months and months, because I didn't have any headaches. Well, then, uh, it was actually a couple Sundays ago after, after church, we were at home, and we were doing, so I don't even remember what we were doing, we were playing around outside, and, and uh, I had this blurry spot in my eye. And I didn't really think a lot about it, except that we were playing soccer, and when the ball comes flying at your face, and you have a blurry spot where the ball is, it's, it, you know, you play the whole game like this. Okay, which makes you ineffective. Um, so, shortly after that, my, my head started hurting again, and it was, a, it was another migraine. Well, I told Christy, I said, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna get a cool rag, put it on my eyes, and get it. So when you, you have a migraine, you want it dark, you want it quiet, you don't leave, just leave me alone. And so I went into the room and I got a rag and I sat on the edge of the bed and guess what's sitting right there in front of me? Peppermint oil. Oh gosh. Did you try it? Pat, <laughs> Pat, I love you. Joe, I love you. I'm gonna try your goofy oil. I don't know where I'm supposed to put it, okay? Because the back of my eyeballs hurt. So I just did a circle around my eyes, you know, and Lay the, lay the goofy thing down. Now I smell like a candy cane. <laughs> lay down, I put the thing over me, and I'm thinking, this is the most idiotic thing. Oh. And about 12 minutes later, I felt absolutely fine. Okay? So I keep the peppermint oil by my bed. Okay? So I absolutely believe, now I don't think all of them work, because I know Joe's given me one that's supposed to help me sleep. All it did was make my big toe smell funny. <laughs> I laid awake the entire night going, man, this stuff stinks. Okay? But I absolutely believe there are some things that are, are naturalistic, that are healthy, that will help you, that will do things for your body to help you get over ailments. Okay, so, so this is not what I'm talking about when I address this issue. What I'm talking about is shamanism. And shamanism is when you are working with and against the spiritual world using incantations or herbs or other things to, to work in such a way that you're addressing a physical problem through spiritual means, okay? And those spiritual means are not godly, okay? So when people are sick, what does is, what is James chapter five tell us we're supposed to do if people are sick? Well, the first thing they're supposed to do is they are supposed to come to the elders of the church. You're not supposed to be laying at home in bed going, oh, why don't they come pray for me? James chapter 5 says, go to the elders, okay, and have them pray for you. And then, and then we anoint and lay on the hands, and, and the sick will be made well. So um, that's the correct approach in the spiritual realm that we are supposed to have. We don't argue with the devil. We don't duke it out with his demons. Uh, we use the authority that God has given us, and we approach God first. There may be times where there is some kind of demonic thing going on. Uh, I think that tends to be more of a rarity than a lot of people do. Uh, quite honestly, I've said it before, you know, we give the devil way too much credit. You know, oh, the devil's really after me today. I've just had a hard time of it. Yeah, the devil's busy over in India or Pakistan or some <laughs> Toledo. Okay, and he's like, what? We, we call a lot of stuff on ourselves. Okay, our flesh is sufficient to get us into a lot of trouble. Our culture is sufficient to get us into a lot of our trouble. Our flesh and our culture combined really gets us into a mess. Okay, so, but there are times, yes, when I think the enemy comes against us specifically, especially as children of God, we declare ourselves to be his enemy. So, shamanism is doing this, this same idea backwards. 
instead of going to the one that is the divine physician, or going to, instead of going to the one that is the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, we go to the one that's inflicting us, afflicting us. And we go and we, shamanism has no place in the Bible. As a matter of fact, all throughout the Torah, we see that any time something like this happened, God said, don't mess with this. As a matter of fact, he said, you know, you, you've got to kill people that do this because it will pervert the nation. Okay, in the New Testament, we see examples of uh, Paul being chased around by the girl that was declaring, oh, these are men of God, these are men of God, and he finally turns around and he casts a demon out of her, and then her owner's mad because there went all his profit and his revenue, and, and that, that caused some other issues. Now, the devil has some power. Don't, don't get me wrong. You read Revelation, and you're going to see that the, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the beast, they're going to do miraculous things, and people are going to be like... Oh my gosh, this guy's for real. Okay? It says, as a matter of fact, it says that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. But we know that's not possible. Okay? So there are things that he can do, and there are things that he can't do. But for the Christian, um, anything that smacks of spiritualism or shamanism or, or um, animism, anything like that, um, that has no place in our lives. No place in our lives. Okay, so uh, as far as, you know, somebody that, that you can go to, um, you know, and give you peppermint oil for a um, migraine, talk to Joe. <laughs> okay? And it was not my intent to talk up your snake oil, Joe, but <laughs> truth will out. But, but Mike did point something out. Uh oh, what did Mike point out? Yes. Yeah, we anoint with oil, but it's not the oil that heals us. It's God. That's right. So, um, but yeah, there is there is that. Okay, so the next two questions are, are kind of along a different vein. Um, I'm going to try and get through both of these because the, the two questions that I have remaining, they're actually probably going to take up our entire service next week. Um, so I'm going to do these fairly quickly. Is the earth thousands of years old or millions? Well, here's, here's where I'm at. Okay. People can argue science all you want. But the scientific method requires that you put something in a controlled environment to prove or disprove your theory. And I don't know anyone yet that can create something out of nothing in a controlled environment or in an uncontrolled environment. Okay? You always have to have something to start with. Okay? So as far as the sciences, I'm just going to set this aside for a moment. Okay, because I've, I've heard the arguments on both sides, okay? And they're very, very intelligent people on both sides. What I want to talk about is kind of going back to one of the earlier questions is, can we trust this? Can we trust this? Okay, now, God didn't give us a marker for the date. He didn't say, you know, 2016... B.C., I spoke and everything came into existence. He didn't give us a date. Some people believe that he gave us a method of dating through the genealogies. That could be very effective if we know for sure that the genealogies are intact. The problem is a lot of times the genealogies would skip generations to go from one key figure to another key figure. And you'll see that in different genealogies. They'll list them out and you'll go, well, what happened to these people? Well, they're not talking, they're not addressing that issue. They're addressing something specifically else. Um, I believe that everything in Scripture is in there on purpose and with a reason. We've looked at some of those things when we finished up the feast and we looked at Purim. Uh, we looked at the names and the genealogies of a couple of the major characters that were in there for a reason. Okay? Haman was an Agagite. Agag was the last king of the Amalekites. Okay? And, and God had sworn that he was going to wipe out the Amalekites. Well, when Saul was, was charged to wipe them out, he didn't wipe them all out. And we know this because uh, Samuel came into the camp and he heard the people and he heard the animals. And Saul told him, hey, well, we kept the best. You know, we wanted to offer it to God because he deserves the best. And Samuel said, well, God desires obedience, not sacrifice. And he had the king brought out and he killed the king. Well, we see that Haman... Uh, who is the enemy in, in the book of Esther, um, he is a descendant of Agag. So he's an Amalekite. 
Okay, and then we see Mordecai, who's another main character in this, and we see that uh, in his lineage, um, he is related to Kish of the tribe of Benjamin. Saul is the son of Kish of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, we were talking about the genealogy. In Mordecai's genealogy, it does not mention Saul. Now, it could be because he's from a different descendant of Kish, or it could be that they weren't trying to give us a, a full genealogical record of Mordecai. They're just letting us know where he came from. Okay? But either way, it's important because what God started through Saul and through Agag, God finished in the book of Esther with Mordecai and Haman because after Haman died and his ten sons were killed, we never see any mention of the Amalekites ever again. Okay. That's why I believe everything is significant in the Bible. Now, personally, do I believe the earth is millions of years or thousands of years? I think it's probably thousands of years for this reason. I don't see any reason why God would, would leave us guessing as to what he did. Okay? What it comes down to for me is this. All right. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created. So, immediately I have to determine, do I believe this to be true? Well, if I believe this is true, then I believe in the beginning God created. Now, in the New Testament, Scripture tells us that, that <clears throat> everything was created by the Word. Okay? We know that the Word is Jesus Christ from John 1. Uh, we know that all things are held together, all things are sustained by His power, by His Word. Okay? So, Jesus is the one that keeps all of this stuff stuck together. So I, I wish he'd let loose a little bit of it sometimes. You know, it just slough off, but, but he keeps it all held together. Um, now, jumping up to Hebrews uh, chapter 11, we, we talk about the hall of faith, and there's a couple of statements in chapter 11 um, that really kind of set the tone for me. First is, um, we, we know what faith is, okay? What is faith? Hebrews 1. Okay. <laughs> My Bible doesn't have in it, so speak, speak a little louder. Substance of what we hope for. The substance of what we hope for. The evidence of things unseen. Okay. So we don't really see it, but we, we put our hope, we put our faith in it because we believe it to be true. Now, further down in verse 6, uh, it says that without faith, it is impossible to please God, okay? And, and throughout Scripture, you know, we're, we're called to, to, to wisdom. We're called to pursue wisdom. But, but even the, the wisest of men, being uh, Solomon, didn't really impress God with his wisdom because God already knows it all, and he knows how much Solomon got wrong. He knows how much Solomon missed. Um, God is looking for people of faith, not people of intellect, not people of of insight, not people of, of particular color hair or particular gender. Particular, God is looking for people of faith. Okay, That's what pleases God. Backing up uh, Hebrews 11, uh, verse 3, um, it says, It is by faith that we believe God created everything from nothing. Okay, Now, I've, I've never seen something created out of nothing. I've seen uh, um, um, a lot of things that, that came to being from something else. Um, you know, I've got five kids. Um, we have nine grandchildren. Um, so I, I see creative power at work in that, but there was still something that precipitated that creation. Okay. So is the earth thousands of years old or millions of years old? I don't see anywhere in Scripture that gives me an exact date, but I do see a chronological record from, from Adam all the way down through John and, and Revelation, and I don't see why God would, would tease us or, or make it difficult for us to understand. How many thousands of years old? I don't know. I don't know. I, I really don't. Um, you know, um, the, the next question that we have is, is um, I believe it has to do with uh, carbon dating. Is carbon dating accurate? I know. I, I know that a lot of people depend on carbon dating, 
but I also know that carbon outside influences can affect carbon dating. Uh, for example, something that is sitting out in exposure will have a different carbon dating meeting than something that was buried underneath. So you have the same rock, one that's been exposed, and, and part of it that has not, uh, you'll get different readings from the top and the bottom. I know that there have been tests done where they've applied uh, different types of dating uh, or, or carbon dating from different labs and they've come up with a wide spectrum of years. I also know that carbon dating has proven um, to be accurate in a lot of cases. So is it accurate? I guess it depends on what's being tested and who's doing the testing. Okay. Uh, there are other methods for dating things, um, and those methods a lot of times don't agree with carbon dating, radiocarbon dating. Um, you know, the, so there, there's there are a lot of variables that come into this. To just say yes would be spurious. Uh, to to just say no would be ignorant. Okay, so to to try and balance the two, I, I don't know for sure. Uh, it, it really depends on what's being tested, the environment, which that thing existed before it was tested, and who's doing the testing and how they did the testing. Okay? So, you know, when you see something radiocarbon dating said this is this age. Well, what if it says it's millions of years old? You just said you believed it's thousands of years old. You know, God created the birds of the air in flight. He spoke them into existence. By the way, that answers the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? It had to be the chicken. And at that point, it was either flying or falling. Okay? Um, I believe that if God could say, let there be light, and there was light, and the amount of time from where God spoke it to the time it was observed, if that could in any way be measured, uh, I believe that God spoke light into place throughout creation. So the light that was, you know, say I'm here and God's where he is, uh, and my perception of light, it was instantaneous with his creation of light because he put it all there in that order, in that way. Um, the same thing I believe when people look at, um, you know, well, we wouldn't be able to see stars that are millions of light years away if the earth was only a couple thousand years old. Well, that, there are a couple reasons that could answer that. One, uh, the belief that, that, that the universe is expanding and that when uh, things came into being, it exploded out and it's continuing to grow. Things would, would move faster and closer to the center than they would the further away they get from the center. The other thing is, I think God put them into place exactly where he wanted them and he put them there to be assigned to man so there had to be a way for man to see that sign so the light had to be there so man could see it. Okay, Because it says that the, the stars and the moon were given to us for signs and seasons. Okay. And it wouldn't make any sense for God to put them out there millions of light years away and then Adam sitting in the garden going, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what season it is because there's nothing up there for me to see. So uh, I think God created it to be visible in the moment. All right. Now, ultimately, what it comes down to this, folks, I'm not a scientist. Okay. Um, I've not made a pursuit of studying things, uh, the physics of things and the, the molecular um, components of things, I, I, I've not done that. What I've, what I've done is I've made a study of this. Okay, And when I look at this, and I see that this is trustworthy, Okay, uh, I see people get really excited and, and emotionally involved in, in these things. Look, as a believer, as a mature believer, we should be able to speak of all things with grace, right? <clears throat> we speak the truth in love, and, and actually, a lot of times, the fact that we're speaking is indicating that we're not loving because we really should be shutting up. You know, Proverbs makes it very clear that even a fool is thought wise when he shuts up. Okay, I've had a lot of people think I was really smart when I didn't talk. Okay, I let them be deceived. Okay, so ultimately, what it comes down to for me, this is the truth, and there are certain things in this that weren't answered because I don't think God felt like we needed the answer. God didn't give us a date of creation because he, he said, you know, uh, what would they do with that date, okay? Let's say it's November 16th, because that's a good day, okay? November 16th of whatever year, November 16th would be the day, and, and how long would it be before we started worshiping that day, okay? We, we worship the creator, not the creation, okay? So don't, don't allow yourselves to be troubled by this stuff. Don't allow it to trip you up. 
Don't, don't get so in, in heated and involved with things that, that you forget that you are Christ's ambassador, Christ's representative. We speak the truth in love, right? 